Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. I uh, How are you doing over there? I've been running into little snags, just, just up and down. Uh, so... Th- the first, I, I think, that you experience is that, for some reason right now, and I haven't even looked into this, I just kind of confirmed it before the, the show, the uh, journal cuddle uh, is is broken on new Ubuntu installs uh, via DigitalOcean, so I don't know what they've done, what they've, they've updated, and it's weird because the file's there, but journal cuddle can't read it. Now, a restart seems to fix the problem of... of um, system D-journal D. So I, I I know it's set up correctly. There's some initiation though that is that is going haywire. So I gotta f- figure out what that is, or or contact the people who who can let me know what that is. Right. So now our deploys, which we have so ingeniously used journal cuddle to look for the conclusion of the cloud in its script, are, are are now breaking because journal cuddle is now broken. So there's. It's something, right? It's there's always, always something. something. There's always something, right? There's always administrative work because there's always something. Um, even when the administrators um, administrate too much and delete production instances, um, <laughs> you know that being case, the case, we we got to we got to have an impromptu restore test uh, recently, and we got to to restore the. Uh, Compositional Enterprises um, our Compose instance, which hosts our Run Deck uh, instance, our service, and our book stack, book stack, board. and yep, oh, yeah, yep, all that. That's basically all of our services. All yeah. of that. Yeah. So that trial by fire with yeah. that one, if you ask me. Uh, I was I was happy about that. You know, being able to at least go through the process of doing that and and testing that out and well. Having already tested it, having that testing that out, <laughs> already, having already tested that, having a, a instance where it was you know very important. So, um, having done that, I was I was happy that it, it came out the way it did. So, uh, I think all we lost were about a day and a half worth of data. Um, yeah, and yep. and that is, I mean, I'm not going to go into backup here because we already went over it. But the the ability to restore is kind of broken up into two different metrics, right? It's when is the latest time you can restore from, and how long is it going to take that restore to come up? Um, and I think where we really win is how long it takes that restore to come up, right? We may not have had a, a, a day's worth of data, right? But we were up within an hour, hour and a half, I think it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I had a I had a do a couple manual tweaks just because of course we do custom stuff but uh all in all i was i was really happy with getting that back up yeah that's always a little bit frightening to see that in production instance has been deleted but good to know restore backup and restore are working because trust me backups are not restores just because you have the data doesn't mean you can successfully restore from it but getting into i think the intro here uh on top of those, we have <laughs> what the government calls now the biggest seizure of assets, I think is what it's now been declared. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers the Bitfinex, Bitfinex hack um, back in 2016, 2017. Well, sure enough, that couple was just busted, I believe, in New York. And you're never going to believe it, but the guy... <laughs> the password had his private as the private key to the wallet just it was hanging out there i think he had two copies of it one was just hanging out in the cloud just in a folder and then one was just on his desktop on unencrypted just hanging out unencrypted you know nothing fancy about it just hanging out ready for someone to grab it um but they were busted just recently within the past week um and we'll see where it goes from here. Honestly, if you asked me why he wasn't encrypting it, <laughs> yeah, because I couldn't be able to give you a good answer. I really would not be able to give you a good answer. There's there's a lot of talk, especially around. I, I don't remember who it was, it was this case, but you know, a lot of different cases where Bitcoin does get seized. Right the the 
legitimacy of this as a, you know, anti-censorship measure gets called into question. You're like, all right, well, if it can be seized, how is this secure? It's like, well, it's not like they broke the Bitcoin protocol, right? right. It's that someone literally had the keys sitting, you know, under their front entry mat. You know, that's that's not a seizure. That's, you know, a criminal being dumb. You know, that's <laughs> it's a Darwin award right there. So... <laughs> So, yeah, and, and I can't remember if you were, you know, talking about if they kept their keys on, on like, a, a cloud um, or or not, you know, if it was if it was in some kind of, like, repository or something like that. Um, but, I mean, that would be something that you would expect uh, authorities to have access to anyway, so you'd want to do something and click encrypt that client side uh, so that right. you're, you're not just throwing that up uh, into someone else's computer. Right. And someone else's computer that they may take away from you, uh, given any change in whim, just be- really just because they feel like, yeah, it, right? I mean, just because they feel like we it. just saw and, and actually link in here in the intro, you know, Google uh, took away the legacy G Suite accounts, you know, the, 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 the free accounts that they've been getting given out since, you know, the early, you know, mid 2000s up to like 2012. Right from from 2006 to 2012, anyone could sign up for a Google account with a custom domain, um, you know, and a lot of people did for you know non technical users because that was Google. You know, Google is something that is very easy to work with for non technical users. Now you and I, we can go to Name Silo, right. Namecheap, we can yeah. go to you know a, a DNS registrar, register that, um, go to a DNS uh, provider, and 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 put in uh, our details there and we can we can host that because we know we understand how that works right people who don't are going to use these types of services um, and google used to offer them for free um, they no longer offer them for free but they were grandfathered in and now a lot of people are are understanding that they were no longer grandfathered in <laughs> <laughs> 10 years later 10 years down the road uh hey by the way that free account we gave you uh yeah we're getting rid of that and you have until late june you know and maybe to, this is a sign that google is in fact not trawling through your email in order to sell ads to you maybe they are losing subscription services so they need to get you off that free account right um maybe they're just trying to pinch pennies i don't know i'm not going to speculate all i know is that once again they are rescinding an offer that you know a lot of people rely on i mean if you look at the um the google stadia release right and and that's something i linked to here as well but you know the the city release got not not yanked right but at least they are they are rebranding it and deprioritizing it right and they're not going to be working on it you know and they sold a lot of subscriptions to this this stuff right this is something that they really hyped up this is something that they said Come and we will take care of your gaming needs. Just like before, they said, come and we will take care of your email and hosting provider needs, right? And time and time and again, we see that's just not the case. Now, and, and you had an interesting take, you know, them being an, an advertising company, not a hosting that's what company. they are anymore. Yep. Yeah. Anymore, you look at them, they have gone, just name a messaging service. Mm. I think they've gone through mm. 12 since they've been a company, since 2001. They've gone through 12, I think the number, like, think about that allo voice all those all those services just think if you're like yep. oh hey we migrate yeah we migrated our entire team to x and <laughs> the provider just pulling the rug on it's it's a rug pull basically at that it at is. that level it's just like oh hey by the way we no longer provide support it's like dude we just bought this a year ago you're gonna make me transition everyone over one more time so i don't know I, if you ask me I, and i think this came up in discussions around their Oh man, what is it? Anti, uh, or what is it? The one the mega core, the antitrust, or no? I'm, yeah, is it antitrust? is it antitrust? Yeah, it, antitrust. It's like where they break up all the co- yeah. big companies, yeah. big organizations. Yeah. Um, they basically said, all right, if it split into do two businesses, it would be the products business and the AdSense business. So it's like, oh well. Good luck with the products one because they can't hold on or create a, yeah. a pro- they can't they can't, their products suck. <laughs> End of the day. End of the day. <laughs> you know, and and I look at um, the the recommendation I I really uh, liked from leaddev dot uh, com. I, I have I have that linked in here, um, and it's talking about how to 
embrace operational transparency, right? And and the way that you conduct yourself matters, right? We, we talk about agile. We talk about working within teams. We talk about, you know, how to empower people and, and you know, be empathetic and stuff. But how we present ourselves to the outside world matters just as much, if not more, right? You know, open source gives you know, creators the ability, they say here, to accelerate development, learn from community of experts, and incorporate thoroughly reviewed code, right? So we we have all those freedoms and it, it gives us this, this benefit, right? But what do we get from operational transparency, right? What do we get from putting our our form and, and function out there, right? So they, they have a couple things. Uh, the ones that stood out to me when we think about in terms of, you know, fang companies, you know, Apple, Google, uh, Netflix, Amazon, right? They, they talk about, you know, what are the project's affiliations, right? Um, and, you know, are these run by nefarious you know, well, Google used to not be evil, so I couldn't I couldn't call them out on that before. But you know, who knows what they're doing right now with with affiliating, and especially you know with their AdSense part of the company, right? Right. What? Right. How are they getting their claws into these different projects? Right? How how are they how are they using these in a way such that you know the original project maintainers wouldn't even necessarily be aware of it or, or have have intended that right um, so and and you know where is it where is it going right because once you're affiliated with something I mean anymore if you're affiliated with Google you're like all right well this will last about a year and a half and then you know don't count on me totally. to do anything. Totally. Basically, every single Google pro- project anymore is a pump and dump. I, you know, I don't. We're gonna migrate you. No, it's like uh, we're gonna migrate you until you decide. All right, I'm. Done. Yeah. Like I, 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 yeah. I can't do this. <laughs> I'm tired of migrating users. Why put yourself through the hassle? Yeah, exactly. You know, and and another one she brings up, as I just said, is is the funding sources, right? Um, and sure. and yeah, you know, where 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 are you getting this this income, which is gonna be driving the direction of the project and the future initiative and the prioritization, right? Because if if apparently Stadia isn't making money, you see it, you know, in the words of our technica, it's getting deprioritized. Right. What what does that mean? Pulling funding? It's no one can work on this anymore? Is that what that means? Yeah, you're gonna be you're gonna be shuffling no resources. Yeah. I hate that right. word for people. You know, shuffling resources. Right. You're gonna you're gonna right. be moving people to a different project when they've they you brought them on because they're gaming enthusiasts because they love the idea of you know having this kind of streaming type of service uh, uh, around and 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 you're gonna put them on something completely different, right? Because you're you you can't put enough advertising in it or or, or what, right? And and it doesn't seem like a lot of people really know. So. I'm sure eventually we're going to understand why Google is the way they are. But right now, you know, if if you're looking for a project that has stated goals and a stated direction and a, you know, solid funding model, our Compose has all of that in spades. Yep. Right. So we are looking for this to be sustainable until I'm no longer around at least. That's how I yeah I was gonna say that's I'm in the same boat. There's 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 nothing so disruptive unless it's the internet literally ble- being blown away, right? That would really interrupt what we're doing here. This is something that we're in it for the long haul. Yeah, I was gonna say it's gonna take a lot to get us away. I, I think we've been going at it now three years. Mm-hmm. I think we started the podcast two years yep. ago. So if anything, we're just gonna keep chugging along. Yep, and if you want to be a part of that, go to ourcompose.com, sign up for the mailing list. It's the number one thing to do. Number two thing to do is to continue listening to this very podcast that you are currently listening to, um, in which we discuss Firefly 3. Oh, actually, first we have a couple uh, community updates, no? We have a couple quick ones yeah they're very quick here so i'm not going to go through uh, as i have in the past i'm not going to go through the release notes on these projects basically i'm just going to give a high level overview if you're interested and want to learn more they are linked in the show notes so vault warden 1.24.0 is out uh dollar bar 15 was relayed the firefly 3 data importer i think is at 0.8.0 and wordpress is 
just getting ready for 5.9. If, if not, I think it's already out here, uh, and they're, they're just getting ready for it. So I, I linked in uh, basically what the, ma- the past month in WordPress looked like, but all of these are going to be in the show notes. I don't, I'm not going to go through the release notes. There's nothing, nothing major to discuss on these. The one thing I would note is that the data importer, um, I had talked to the maintainer uh, of Firefly 3 as we had covered last week, uh, and he had pointed out that the data importer is, in fact, a separate service. So that is something that we can look to introduce if anyone is super concerned about that. Um, luckily, the way we spin up Docker containers, this would just be yet another one. So right. no fear that this would be fairly painless um, to to achieve. But speaking about Firefly 3, uh, we do have that as our main topic of the podcast today. So I am going to go through that and the integration discussion, and then Jack's going to talk about the four-hour work week. So Firefly 3 here. Uh, We went over last episode the accounts, I believe it was, uh, for Firefly 3 and and some of that uh, conceptually. I wanted to take it back and, and, and zoom out back into what this this service actually is right and what it looks like and how we interact with it and and where we're going to be finding everything so we're going to go over the application interface i don't know how far i'm going to get um we may need to make this a two-parter but we do have uh, plenty for us to cover the first thing i'm going to go over here is what firefly 3 looks like when we are first getting started so the the, the first introductory page of Firefly 3 is very nice because it has a very simple welcome screen to get you started with the most basic of setups. So when you when you log into Firefly 3 for the very first time, uh, you're going to be prompted to put in you know a, a bank name of yours and a balance um, and an optional savings balance as well as the language that you want Firefly 3 to be presented in. So that is, that is right off the rip uh, getting you off the ground running. Um, and so you're going to be you're going to be starting with what you currently have, and then going from there and and making your your budget as you go. Uh, there is also introduction guidance for all screens. So as you go through all these different screens, and and there's a lot we're going to be covering a lot of them today. As you go through them, uh, the introduction guidance will actually pop up. Like the first thing is just just pops up you know you can dismiss it but it will walk you through the details on that page Um, you can always re-enable it because it's only the the first time but you can re-enable it uh, by hitting the the question mark button in the header and selecting the the re-enable introduction guidance Uh, and that will give you it's basically tool tips but it's super nice because it will highlight exactly where what they're talking about is and walk you through what this page looks like where i should expect everything to be etc etc so that's been that's been super helpful uh, as i put these together today i have the dashboard uh, financial control and accounting pages to go through uh, so the dashboard itself, Firefly 3, is a PHP application, go figure, and it's it's very well put together, uh, it's it's very logical, it, it groups everything together, uh, and it, it ties everything together very, very well. For instance, there is an omnipresent header on all of the pages, uh, which gives you access to a couple of different things. Uh, you can uh, there you can go to the the home page um, you can open and close the side menu so the side menu will have all of these sub pages for you uh, you can access help for the current page um, it'll give you your user details as well as a create new stuff button and this is a really really cool idea because this is a I just want to put something in button uh, this will create Everything from withdrawals to deposits, transfers, new checking accounts, savings accounts, what it will give you the ability to, oh, I just want to do this real quick, and it will give you ability to do that. Um, so that, that button's super handy, uh, especially for me, who, who tends to lose track of, of the 15 different threads I'm pulling on at the same time, and and allows me to, to get that immediately. The dashboard display itself, right, the, the, the very front page of Firefly 3, 
uh, is, uh, I, I say here, it's a pleasant mix of appropriate graphs, charts, and lists with buttons to go to the detail page view or to create entries where appropriate. Right. So it's a, it's a very good inner overview. Uh, across the top is actually a banner of several key statistics, uh, such as your balance, bills to pay, what you have left to spend, and your net worth. Um, this provides a good at-a-glance overview of your general financial health. All right. So th so this front page is a like I said just a, a, a mix of ways to present things like uh, I, I especially like in his demo instance he has a whole bunch of transactions like uh, you know get coffee in the morning and groceries and stuff and you can see that list that recent list you know of what was just uh, transacted uh, to the side so that's that makes a lot more sense than having like a bar graph or a, a, a pie right. graph or something right. like that. So right. um, these are these are very appropriate and and um, you're able to kind of hone in on what you are there to do. And that will take you to the subsequent pages. Now, there are plenty of subsequent pages. Um, I'm just going to go over several of them today, uh, namely the financial control section and the accounting section. Um, there is a final others section that has a lot uh, in there that either Jack, you know, or me, if I'm unlucky enough, will do next episode. <laughs> uh, the financial control, though, uh, it has I uh, three sections in it, and they all kind of have a, a similar feel to them, um, but I'll go over them one at a time here. So the, the budgets page shows you an overview of your budgets. Right. Top bar shows sure. the amount that's available to be budgeted. Uh, this can be customized for any period. Uh, the amount you've actually spent is shown in the bar right below that. So you got these two bars, what's total and what you've actually spent. Right. So it's a very easy uh, visualizer of what your budget is looking like. Uh, below that are the expenses per budget and what you've budgeted for them. Right. Now, in the documentation, I've linked to the concept page for the budget, so you can kind of go into what is that supposed to represent, what should I be looking at, how should I be thinking about this. Um, that may or may not be a, a segment that we go over, uh, just because there are so many things to cover when it comes to personal finances. We're going to have to figure out how we want to group this together so it doesn't become, you know, 20 Firefly 3 episodes. Right. You know, we should right. we should be able to cover the basic concepts um, fairly quickly. But they are linked here um, for the budgets, bills, and piggy banks. So for the bills, the, the next page, uh, that page contains a listing of the bills that you've created along with all of the details, including links to the relevant rules and the recurrence period, among other things. Uh, clicking on individual bills will show a table with some general information about the bill. It also shows a chart of the transactions linked to the bill. Uh, there's uh, lastly also a button to rescan any old transactions uh, so they will be matched to the bill. Uh, so bills as a concept, you know, once again, are, are um, things that we're not necessarily going to go into right now, but easiest way to conceptualize sure. them is uh, expenses that we've identified as recurring on a stable basis. Right. So these, these, bills we kind of know are going to be coming due and the way firefly 3 using their envelope method tracks them uh, is by putting them in this this bill section here um, and those recurring are rent utilities would you put it's anything that's reoccurring yeah it's anything right? that that's, it's that's basically okay yeah exactly okay. Yeah, um, and and it's not just bills but like if i know i'm getting groceries every single month right that could be something that i put under the bills right yeah um okay. there yeah. are the the way firefly 3 does it is the way any envelope system would do it right it gives you envelopes and expects you to be able to categorize it appropriately right so it's up to you and and there's categories and there's tags and there's a lot of other concepts um around how firefly 3 expects to work as well as how it allows you to work um, so maybe that's a, a episode we want to do is to say, you know, what are the actual guardrails that it puts into place and what is in between those guardrails that you have the freedom, the wiggle room to, to play around in. To customize, yeah. yeah. Um, because they, they do include a lot, like the last one here, piggy banks, 
right? So piggy banks um, are, are just kind of like saving goals, right? So piggy banks uh, on the, the page there are shown in list form and are shown as they are grouped uh, if grouping is enabled uh, into their relative relevant groups. Note that the total of all the groups is not displayed if there are multiple groups. That was something I noticed there. Uh, the ungrouped piggy banks are shown in their own separate ungrouped group, which is okay. how that works. Sure, uncategorized, basically. Yeah. Uh, the bottom of the page ungrouped also groups. displays a status of your accounts, which any of the piggy banks are saving on. So every piggy bank actually has an account that they're saving on or saving against, however you want to phrase that. Um, this is a field that's set when creating a new piggy bank. Um, you can also go in and edit the piggy bank to change the account that you want it to save on. Um, and then, at like I said, at the bottom of the page, it, any of the piggy banks that you're saving on will be displayed down there, the, the status of those. Uh, clicking on the name of the piggy bank will give you a graph of the events and a summary of the history and current status of the piggy bank. So, um, once again, you can drill down into the individual entries in the list. You know, I, I, I hate to say it's just a glorified way to display a database, but you know, it's that's what a lot of applications. That's are what anymore. a lot of apps are. But it's, I mean, it's it's very pretty. I will give it that. It, it is very yeah. pretty. Uh, and, and getting over to the accounting section here, it's so pretty that I really did not write a whole lot about the accounting section. Right? Okay. Um, there are two sections to accounting. Um, they look basically, well, they don't necessarily look the same, but they're, they're both uh, a, a listing page, right? Uh, so they're, they're both rows of all these, whether they're transactions or automation, right? So the transaction pages has, have a listing of the transaction for that particular type of transaction. Uh, as well, there are charts on the top for the categories, budgets, or source accounts, and destination accounts. So the, the transactions um, are actually split out into different classes. So you can have like assets, liabilities, expenses, uh, and a fourth one I forget right now, but but they all look basically the same. So like for all of those accounts, uh, you're gonna have that listing of the transactions. Whether it's an asset account, you're gonna see all the listings there. Expense account, uh, revenue account, and liability I guess are the four. Um, and then for the automation, uh, which is separate from the the transactions and and their accounts, the automation pages are a listing of all the automations available on the account. Uh, the rules are grouped according to the existing rule group. So you can actually group these rules into to rule groups. And I think that's definitely something we're going to have to pay attention to as far as like, how does automation work? Because a lot of people right. don't want to do that. You know, it's, and, and I'm not blaming them. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this every month. Sure. I'm not right. blaming I get them. It. Yeah. I, I would rather have computers do stuff for me too. In fact, I spend most of my day asking them to do stuff for me. So um, if they could do this, that'd be great. Uh, so, so diving into that, I think would be advantageous. Um, now, rules are grouped according to. Oh, I said that. Um, it also displays most of the details about the individual rules or recurring transactions in the table. Uh, now, going in and editing those, um, you'll see a list of all the available fields in there, as well as a list of trigger for the rules. Um, there are many details in the individual rules and recurring transaction entries um, that are worth explaining in depth, and I actually do call it out here, and I think we want to cover that in a, in a different concept uh, discussion here. Uh, so that is, that is the first, that, actually the majority of Firefly 3, right? So, I mean, what, what did we yeah. really go over? We, well, we have a dashboard uh, that Firefly 3 has. Of course. We have that. Um, we have the financial control, which is kind of the, the, the bigger concepts of so the budgets and the bills and the, the piggy banks and, and and the cool ways that you can tie assets together and transactions together, right? And then right. they have the section where you can actually drill down into those individual transactions, those those you know individual accounts, right? And then set up rules for those individual transactions and those individual accounts. Um, the other section is going to have a plethora of things, and uh, those will be touched on in a later episode. But this covers the major portion of how we can conceptualize how Firefly 3 shows us the, the pr uh, financial health uh, of, of our finances. Sure. And it's important to track money, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, 
everyone has a goal to retire one day, right? No one wants to work until the day they die. I, I don't think that's a goal of many people to say, I want to work until I die. Uh, Tim Ferriss presents an idea here of, quote, the four-hour work week, which, boy, did I have some opinions on this. <laughs> well, but <laughs> first, I just wanted to say I think Firefly 3 is a great intro into this because this this book talks quite a bit on money and how it's actually money's not the end right it's just a means to do something so we all have our own individual goals what they look like you know what we want to do and i really like how he described it he said money is multiplied in practice it's it's the practical value right what uh, multiplied by the number of w's is what he says number of w's you have control of in your life and the four w's are the what the when the where and he calls it the with whom right and if you're able to control those things times the amount you know you make i guess is what he kind of describes it as then you're you're sitting pretty good and he brings up this great example of someone working 80 90 100 hours a week making 100k and it's like oh that whoa you know looks great on paper right looks absolutely everyone's like oh 100k that oh yeah sounds great on paper then he brings up someone who works four hours a week but makes 40 40k and you ask who makes more well I phrase this wrong. Who makes more? Obviously, it's a guy making 100K. But if you take in his multiplier, right, if you say, okay, well, if you're, you know, 100K over 80 hours, is, I think it comes down to something like, oh, shoot, I want to say 25 bucks an hour, I think is what it averages down to versus the person working four hours every week for 40K averages out to like being 100. Mm. I make 100 an hour or something. So I think that's where the who makes more comes in. You're, someone will have to check me on that math, but okay. uh, essentially, what you end up with is a lot more time, right? You end up with your your budget isn't money; it's time. When you run into these types of issues, so the book really just dives into this concept of the new rich, and it's what he describes as: oh, I fly all around the world, and I just outsource everything, and I. Uh, you know, I have personal assistants that take care of a lot of stuff for me and I automate everything I can up until the point that I can't and then I'll hire someone, but not until it's fully automated do I hire someone to do the task. Um, but really, it's I think it starts with challenging the status quo as he describes it. Uh, he really says, and honestly, this one kind of threw me off a little bit. He says, having an unusually large goal is an adrenaline infusion that provides the endurance to overcome the inevitable trials and turbulations that go along with any goal. So he basically says, like, throw smart goals out the window. Like, come up with the biggest goal you can think of and then just go after it. He says, <laughs> and then he, got, he he just kind of dumps on realistic goals, unfortunately. He says, <laughs> realistic goals, goals restricted to the average ambition level the, are uninspiring and will only fuel you through the first or second problem, at which point you'll throw in the towel, which I get for a lot of people. I can absolutely see that, but I don't think it's a reasonable goal to say, I'm going to walk up, you know, I'm going to go out and walk on the It's like, whoa, 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 hang on, fine you got to take your steps to get there, right? You have to take your steps, but don't make your goal so small that you get bored. And I, I think he brings up this point, um, the mediocre effort, a mediocre goal will warrant the mediocre effort, which I did like. And then he brings up after challenging the status quo, bringing up these high ambitious goals. He compare he basically introduces a brand new concept called dreamlining. And so instead of goal setting, he introduces dreamlining. <laughs> Why? Uh, okay, Tim, you can tell me. I will listen. Um, he says, and this is where he brings back essentially smart goals. So he talks about, you know, goal shift from ambiguous wants to define steps. Uh, the goals have to be unrealistic to be effective. Yes, I said that correctly. They have to be unrealistic because of that ambition level. If you don't have the ambition for it, if it's not a big enough goal, you're going to put in that mediocre effort. And then it focuses on activities that will fill the vacuum uh, when work is created, when when real work is removed. Uh, so living like a millionaire requires doing interesting things and not just owning inevitable things. No, and enviable. Yeah. Enviable things. Um. So he says, don't create five-year goals, don't create three-year goals, create six-month goals and 12-month goals. And really where I, where I think he's going with these goals is 
and when I say goals, I, I don't even want to call them goals yeah, the way he describes them. Yeah. He, it's like traveling. And he kind of describes traveling as a goal, which doesn't sound like a goal to me. It's it's like I, I want to move to Asia is kind of one of his things. He's like, I'm going to go to Japan and do this, or I want to work over there, do whatever. Um, and it's like, wait, hang on. That's not a goal, Tim, but okay, fine. Uh, so dreamlining, fine. I'm just going to describe it as goal setting. It's just a fancy word for it. You can kind of tell what my opinion is starting to shape into for this book. I will say the one practical piece of advice I really liked was progressively challenging yourself to step outside your comfort zone. This is the one thing I really took away from the book that I thought was actually, it was like the shortest little section on it, but it basically had a uh, action item in it that described, hey, there's a direct correlation between an increased fear of your comfort and getting what you want. If you're able to be more uncomfortable and you're able to step out of your own box, basically, then you're not going to be afraid to get what you want, I think is what it boils down to. Didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add in there. No, that's a, there's, there's a lot of psychology around that. So I'm just going to say, I agree. Okay. Fair enough. And I really liked one of the action items it, he had, he kind of throughout the book, he just kind of has actions. He kind of gives like a little lecture, a little spews a bunch of words on paper and then gives like a, Oh, this, you should do this. And, one of them really struck out to me because it was very weird. It, it was maintain eye contact with a stranger until they break eye contact. What is this, some kind of like jungle dominance game here? What is he playing? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but basically, he says, if you're confronted, this is his advice. If you're confronted about it, say, oh, you look like an old friend. It's like, <laughs> okay f- fine fine tim fine 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 um t- <laughs> i'll leave that as what it is I, you can take if people listen to this podcast want to go out and uh test that one out and let us know how it goes <laughs> i would absolutely love to hear how it goes because i i think <laughs> I think that would warrant a lot of uh, aggression from someone else if you're just giving them a stare down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's actually one of Bo Burnham's jokes in his first 2013 special. So that's exactly where I went to. It's literally a comedian just lampooned that already. Uh, man, so some of the advice in this book, uh, take take at your own risk or some of the action items do at your own risk i have a feeling uh, that you'll be going over <laughs> where you agree and disagree at the end of this yeah uh so i i said there was one important thing i took away which was uh pushing yourself to be outside of your comfort zone there was one more mm. i will admit uh, and it's about increasing productivity and kind of describing what what work is efficient and what what's important right? You have to ask yourself, what is important? And after you've defined what's important, what you want to do, I, you know, this always comes back to autonomy, mastery, purpose, I think is what it always kind of boils down to what, you know, what do you want to do with your time? And for us, it's develop on our compose, uh, work on it. Do we love, we love our content. Uh, as much as we say, we aren't content creators. We do a lot of content. Um, but how do you want to spend your time? Mm-hmm. And really what I took away f- as one of the more important things here, uh, he says, doing something unimportant well doesn't make it important, and a task requiring a lot of time does not make it important. So, and and specifically, that goes to something I think we've harped on before, which is the the bullet point right, right above that, differentiating effectiveness versus efficiency. And I will right. I will absolutely stand by absolutely. that that definition, right? Where effectiveness is doing the things that get you closer to your goals, and efficiency is performing that task in the most economical manner. Right. I mean, you can sit there and do work, do work, right? And just because you're doing it doesn't make it. It it, it right. It's. I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but mm-hmm. just because you're doing something doesn't mean it's the right thing. It doesn't mean it's, I don't want to get in the moral. It doesn't mean it's the most important thing. Yep. 
to completing the goal. Yep. Uh, and I think you and I have especially revisited, kind of revisited that as we've completed a, quite a bit of complexity. Um, but just something to keep in mind. And then he goes over Pareto's principle for everyone that's not aware. It's you. It's eighty twenty. Eighty percent of the result. Eighty percent of the uh, result. Yeah. Result is from twenty percent of the action. Twenty percent of the effort. Result yeah. is from eighty percent of the effort. Yep. Uh, so. He does offer two actions, two shorter tidbits here. Uh, limit the tasks to import. Limit tasks to to the important to shorten the work time. So pick out he, he as he goes through. Uh, he says pick out what's the most important. And responding to email, he describes as that's not important. He he goes on kind of a media spiel a little bit a bit later in the book, or I don't know if it was earlier, but he basically says I check my email. I don't check my email. I'm always on the move, and I don't check my phone. And I thought, how how can you be running a business? This is crazy. How are you doing this? Well, of course, if you, you continue to read, which I did because I was just so enthralled with this book, he outsources, Tim outsources everything, like everything. First of all, he, automate, he automates it. So it sounds like he builds his perfect process, uh, as I say. It, yeah, yeah, right. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, he builds the process out and then he hands it to someone to manage and he has personal assistants and he has people he exploits in India for like four dollars an hour to do like all this work um but again there was an important kind of tidbit in here uh he he starts with a story saying my assistant was he says quite literally my assistant is an idiot uh it took him 23 hours to do a task that should have been on in two or three and it was because of the abstract goal that mm-hmm. he provided to his assistant so mm-hmm. it's and i think it describes i don't know if we've touched on it in this podcast or where i touched on it work gives uh i think you and i were discussing this work you give work the amount of takes time, up basically the amount of time that you give it time you allocate it yeah. yeah so if you say give it back to me tomorrow it's going to be tomorrow essentially so if you say, give me three hours and you provide a direct list of, hey, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, and you explicitly state those goals, or I don't want to say goals, those steps to follow, then it's pretty hard for them to deviate off course. Basically, they just that means they just didn't do it. They didn't follow it. Well, and, and setting expectations is important as well, right? right. Because if, if I say, hey, uh, book this interview, right? It should take right. you, you know, maybe 20 minutes on the phone to book it, you know, 20 minutes to find, you know, a place in my schedule and write it down everywhere and get everything organized and get the paperwork done and sent through. And it should take you, you know, maybe another hour to to confirm everything with the credit card and stuff like that. Right. And then. Yeah. Th- so that that should be about two hours. That's it. That's it. Right. 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 And then if you set that expectation on hour seven, they should probably be scratching their heads like what's gone wrong. <laughs> right that's exactly it so he basically provides a solution with he says automate everything but make sure you can't just throw people at a problem thinking it's just going to resolve itself you can't do that and i i completely i'll agree with that one as well um so in the show notes i do have his kind of towards the end he talks on the 13 he calls them new rich mistakes I, i i really don't like that new rich definition but Hence, okay. Uh, and I think where we get to, uh, th- those are important. I'm not going to read them out. Okay. If you are interested, I would definitely check them out. As, uh, as soon as we get to formatting notes. them correctly. Uh, we, yes, yes. Um, but my take on this book, so I actually had to research this after I listened to and read through it. Uh, I listened to it and I read it. And the first time I listened to it, I was like, okay, like, all right i kind of like that and then i read it and i said i do not like this at all so i had to do some research um and sure enough this lifestyle of working only four hours which i feel like i hardly even touched on basically what what the four hour work week means is automate everything outsource everything and let other people deal with it if it's an emergency guess what you're not going to be able to contact me call my personal assistant so it basically said wait, hang on, if you've just fine-tuned processes to such a level that everyone else is taking care of it, you basically basically automated yourself out of the job, which is great, allows you to freeze your time up to do bigger bigger and better things, but 
Uh, but then you're not doing bigger and better things with that. You're just... It's, you're, it sounds like he's not. Yeah. You're right. You're right. He's not. You're right. And so he... <laughs> I think he went on to write a blog post, which I didn't link, saying, quote, this lifestyle is unsustainable. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, no... Yeah, right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, <laughs> after reading your book, I understand why. <laughs> and for that reason... <laughs> I'm gonna throw it out there. I really did not like this mm. book. I, I would, I don't, e- I, 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 I guess it's one of those into the one of those weird spots. I would recommend it just to say what do you think of this, so we can talk about it, and maybe that means it's a good book because it evoked some emotion out of me. Usually, I read a book and go, oh yeah, great, you know, that was a book, but this one just did not like, did not like it, and there were uh, a few important pieces to pull out, but really just not not my book Mm. not my book yeah it i mean there are plenty of other books where you can get the message to challenge yourself to step outside your comfort zone right like how many times has that been rehashed in different contexts you you don't have to read you know automate everything and outsource everything by tim (laughs) ferris to get that (laughs) i think we found a title (laughs) Um. <laughs> no, so I will leave it at that. I will tell you what. Uh, they did have a section. Man, I, maybe it's just these self help. Maybe it's all self help books <laughs> are like this. It, you ask at the end, what goals do you want? What goals yeah. do you have? What dreamlining do you want to do? Um. But man, I I I really think for us, <laughs> it's the uh. Our composed suite, you know, we do dish on Google quite a bit, and I, I think it's unfair for them to just say, "Hey, we're pulling a service that we supported for," you know, say say it was even three years, four years. I y- you wouldn't get that with what we're doing, um, as Andrew said earlier, and I, what I will reiterate here, uh, you know, we're here to probably do this until we, maybe we will do this until we die. Who knows? Uh, but I think that just means more from us bigger and better things uh so if you guys are interested uh the first step is signing up for the mailing list and then if you're even more interested and you want to sign up for an instance you can check out our compose.com but really it, it I, we're around for the long haul is what i have to say and with that we hope you enjoyed today's podcast thank you be safe and goodbye everybody See you all in two weeks.